Like, shall we make a start? Let's let's do it. Correct. So good good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everyone. And thanks for uh, attending the third TCC in virtual seminar. Uh, today we have a uh, Professor Alex uh, Wixky uh, to talk about uh, cognitive radio in space uh, and machine learning. We have never been experienced before. Apparently, I have a very interesting article in the HB Spectrum. I, I read it. It is really uh, uh, attractive for, uh, to a lot of, for, I, I guess, guys like me or young generations. So let's, uh, before uh, Alex talk, let's look at uh, how we conduct the talk today. So all the participants will be muted throughout the uh, webinar, and you will be able to ask questions through Q&A session or at the end of uh, Alex talk, you can raise your hand on your Zoom webinar functions on the uh, control panel, and then we can enable you, you can ask questions uh, directly uh, with your microphone as well. And then if you have any technical questions, go to the chat box and leave uh, any issues there or any questions um, non uh, related to the seminar questions there. And if you do have technical questions related to uh, Alex's talk, then go to leave the questions on the Q&A &A box. And then finally, the webinar will be recorded and we will sharing the link and the slides afterwards on the TCCN website. And I'm um, my name is Yue Gao. I'm very glad to uh, moderate this um, virtual seminar. So before uh, we carry on more, I would like to announce uh, the next seminar invited talk by Professor uh, YC uh, Yingchang Liang, and who is the HV Fellow and ESC of the Transaction on Cognitive Communications and Networks. He's from University of uh, Electronics and Science and Technology of China. He's going to talk about, again, a very exciting new topic, uh, symbolic radio. And that has been scheduled on uh, 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, on Eastern and U.S. Canada time, Tuesday, 20th October. So today is a big topic. We're talking about uh, um, cognitive radio in space and machine learning. And we, we are, as a community, very glad to have Alex, who has been working in this area for a really long time, who has a lot of experience from theory to practical aspect. And um, Professor Alex uh, um, Wixke uh, from uh, uh, WPI in the United States, um, let me to briefly introduce him. He is a full professor in uh, the electronic and electrical and computer engineering, as well as robotics engineering um, at WPI. He has uh, a number of uh, um, reputable grounds supported by industry DAPA, uh, as well as uh, a number of uh, other um, institutions. And he has a, a, a number of publications and gave a lot of uh, um, tutorials as well as keynote talks. As far as I remember, we have invited him to our uh, choral workshop before and gave a very exciting talk uh, to our society. So let's uh, uh, welcome uh, Alex um, for his talk. Thank you. Let me pass my screen to you. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, you. Thank you for a very kind introduction. Um, I, and thank you, everyone, for joining me across the, the globe. I'm looking at all the participants, and it's very impressive to see sort of the geographical spread and, and uh, time zones that everybody is uh, joining this uh, presentation. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, let me start this up. So, so as uh, you, you mentioned, my name is uh, Alex Wiglinski. So I'm a professor here at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts in the United States. And uh, today I'll be uh, presenting some of my work that uh, I've been uh, collaborating with NASA Glenn Research Center, as well as Penn State over 
uh, the past six years uh, on using cognitive radio for, uh, for performing space and satellite communications. Uh, so, um, so the title of this talk is uh, Cognitive Radio, um, where no cognitive radio has gone before, uh, machine learning for space communications. And um, I'm gonna describe, you know, first of all, you know, I, I feel like I'm gonna be preaching to the choir, uh, what is cognitive radio? Um, you know, like a, sort of like, you know, from, from the very beginnings all to what, what the current state of the art is, and then transition into how that state of the art uh, then gets applied to uh, space communications and satellite communications. And then, uh, you know, show some really cool uh, uh, graphs, results, and then a little bit of a prediction of where we're going to go to in terms of the future application of cognitive radio in space. All right. So first and foremost, I really want to acknowledge the support of NASA, uh, specifically NASA Glenn Research Center, uh, via cooperative agreement and NNC 14AA01A, okay? So um, they put out a solicitation about doing cognitive radio space communications. And there was a really cool platform that NASA installed on the International Space Station called the SCAN testbed, okay? Um, and uh, what SCAN, SCAN testbed uh, did is essentially had three software-defined radios, okay, in this one platform, that was attached to the ISS, the International Space Station, that allow you to do different types of communications and navigation experimentation. So this, this grant really was kind of the catalyst for forming this multi-year collaboration between NASA Glenn, Penn State, our other university collaborator, and of course, my, my, my student team here at WPI, okay, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. So thank you to NASA. So um, very important. Okay, so this is kind of like this philosophical discussion when, you know, different cognitive radio folks get together and it's like, what is a cognitive radio, right? Um, this has been around for like a very long time. There has been papers written, sort of like, you know, what makes a cognitive radio? And, uh, you know, a lot of words pop out, you know, those like, you know, word kind of like scatter shots of like, you know, uh, what it should be, right? Things like intelligent, things like agile, dynamic spectrum access, opportunistic, spectrally efficient, all these words, like people think about this, right? And, they're, and depending on which community you come from, you know, like you, you have a very specific notion of what cognitive radio means to you, right? So here with uh, respect to, um, you know, like uh, for the purposes of like defining what I mean, Okay, and in the context of this project, in the context of this work that we've been doing with respect to space and satellite communications and cognitive radio, um, cognitive radio um, uh, means, means something very specific I'm going to describe in a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, the main thing, okay, so the main uh, ingredient for uh, cognitive radio is it needs to be flexible. It needs to be programmable. It needs to be able to assume configurations and tailored to a specific operating environment at any given moment. So that's, that's a very critical ingredient with respect to cognitive radio, right? So, so okay, so let's, let's back up a little bit and to, like, think about like, you know, uh, wireless communications in general, right? Uh, in terms of like what, who are kind of the forefathers to wireless communications? Like what led us to cognitive radio today, right? So you already saw the first guy, right? So Marconi. So Marconi is very important because uh, him, he was one of the first folks that showed sort of the potential of using electromagnetic spectrum and electromagnetic energy to communicate information over the air, right? Like his famous experiment, like the transatlantic wireless communication experiment between Newfoundland and, and Wales, right? Um, and uh, being able to show that over very long distances, you can communicate uh, uh, information wirelessly. Okay, so very important. So feasibility that we can actually communicate information wirelessly. Second person, Shannon. Everybody, like, you know, without a doubt, Shannon's quite critical because he established sort of bounds on which we can achieve uh, uh, error-free communications. And then everybody then began developing algorithms in order to reach Okay, that bound, right? And, and that's really what kind of accelerated things along. So, okay, feasibility of wireless uh, communications, check. Uh, then uh, given that we can 
send wireless information, uh, what are the information bounds that we can communicate uh, th those bits uh, over a wireless medium? Okay, cool. Now, uh, the other sort of what I consider critically important with respect to cognitive radio now, right? Um, and sort of the evolution of, of the wireless uh, technology as it develops is, is not, like you don't think about it first, but it's like, ah, oh, yes, yes, these guys, okay? Are these three gentlemen, right? Um, uh, uh, Bar Bardeen, Bertain, and Shockley. So these folks uh, obviously uh, were kind of critical with the development of the transistor. Very important, super important. Like, you know, I, essentially the development of computing technology has really accelerated in uh, sort of the development of the latest and greatest in terms of wireless technology, right? So we can communicate information over the air, check. We know what the bounds are in terms of communicating the information, check. The ability for the radio to assume different capabilities and really tailor itself to very, potentially very harsh and, and challenging wireless environments, check. Because of the ability to have programmable radios, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and, and, and tailor those algorithms in order to meet, um, uh, meet those bounds and be able to take on those challenging wireless environments. Okay? All right. So... Um, just a little bit of a timeline. This is actually um, a figure straight from my uh, 2009 book on cognitive radio. Um, like this kind of shows kind of the evolution, right? There is a lot of a kind of strong correlation between the evolution of the wireless technology and the evolution of the computing technology, right? So there you have Moore's law and the evolution of the microprocessor. And, and then in, in, in tandem to that, you have following uh, one of the obvious applications of this computing technology is wireless technology and enabling it to do really cool stuff. So it makes it flexible, it makes it agile, it allows to run very advanced algorithms, and the more processing power you put into these radio platforms on these microprocessor chips, um, the more advanced um, communication algorithms you can run in order to make these, um, the, these uh, communication devices kind of take on more and more challenging environments, right? And so you can actually see here in this graph things from like the hardware radio with like transistors, uh, sorry, not transistors, like capacitors and resistors and inductors and all these other things soldered together. And then you progressively go along things like the software controlled radio, the software defined radio, the dynamic spectrum access radio, and then finally, da 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 da, the cognitive radio, right? So when we talk about like this computing technology, it is, it's, this is actually no, this is not, this, that we cannot, un, like, under, uh, we, can, we cannot underestimate its impact, right? We've gone through rooms and rooms and rooms of vacuum tubes and, and that sort of like, you know, sort of processing power to essentially, you know, my own students as they come in as freshmen to university saying, oh yeah, yeah, we know how to use a Raspberry Pi. Right. Uh, one of the accelerators of this obviously is, uh, is the cellular telephone industry, right? So, so when, when people go along and they say, hey, I have a cell phone, like, here, I'm gonna pull this up. You know, like you have a form factor like this and you can play things like games and such or check your email and such. Uh, but but in, in addition to that, like, you know, the DSP technology that goes into this, as well as a lot of the other sort of processing technology to run those algorithms in such a small form factor, this opens up a lot of po potential, a lot of possibilities, right? So because of the cell phone, because of, um, you know, the introduction of these really compact um, uh, communication devices, this really then pushed back, I, I would say, on the uh, microprocessor industry and sort of said, okay, okay, great. Like, you know, we have these desktop computers, we moved from mainframes, we moved from computers full, that fill up rooms. Now I need to hold it in my hand. Now I need to have the phone be flexible and such. What can you do for me? And so what happens is we've now really are pushing sort of the, uh, the potential of the microprocessor technology and its ability to really compute in real time, right? Like RTOS and, and things like that and, and be able to run communication algorithms and again, to do really cool nifty stuff in challenging environments. Okay, so I haven't talked about like uh, cognitive radio yet. I'm just talking about 
running communication algorithms, DSP algorithms, signal treatment algorithms in order to do really cool nifty stuff that every year progressively gets more and more advanced, right? So now, um, let's talk about cognitive radio. Um, so this, okay, the, the concept is, and this is kind of like a really sort of like cool PowerPoint, like, you know, three bubble type of representation. So the, the holy trinity, if you will, of the cognitive radio is the ability to sense the environment. Okay, that's fine. Like, you know, communication systems should be doing that. Uh, you know, if you have an increase in the packet error rate, um, you know, monitoring the received uh, signal strength of whatever your uh, signal you're trying to intercept, uh, bandwidth, uh, if you're interfering with other signals, things like that. Uh, even like, you know, on board, if it's a sort of like a limited power supply, how much power you have left on your mobile device. Uh, these are all sort of factors that your wireless device should be sensing, okay? So sense, okay, important. What's your situational awareness? Uh, then there's learn, okay? So if it's an environment that your wireless device ha has not experienced before, right? Uh, if it has experienced, well, then it's very easy. I've seen this. I do that, right? And that's the adapt bubble down there. If I have not seen this, then what would be an appropriate set of actions I need to take to adapt to that new scenario? And then what happens is, let's say, just like if like, you know, you're learning how to ride a bike, um, well, what happens is you might fall off a few times and say, okay, I'm not gonna ride a bike this way. I'm gonna try this way. Oh, this kind of worked better. I'm gonna go down this path. So there's sense, learn, adapt, sense, learn, adapt, sense, learn, adapt, all right? That's cool, all right. So what ends up happening is the cognitive radio, right? If you want like a, a more accurate sort of, uh, sort of uh, block diagram is you sense the environment around you. Okay, you take measurements um, and it could be any variables, right? The, so the, you know, and at any layer of the communication system. And then what you do is you filter out all that data, right? You got to filter out. Maybe you can also pull off prediction. I think based on how the signal strength's going, it's probably going to get even worse, okay? Okay, great. So you might have some prediction, but at a bare minimum, you might want to just filter out what the measurements of your surrounding environment might be, right? And then that feeds into both a decision-making block, right, as well as a learning block and which also feeds into the decision making. So, so what happens is that's where it's like you adapt if you know it. And if you haven't seen something like that, you begin to learn and say, oh, I'll, it's kind of similar to that scenario. Maybe I should use these parameters and make this decision on what the configuration or what my radio should do. And then I make action, right? And then at the same time, I might actually store away some of those measurements for later on, right? That's the ex external sensor data. So, um, so that's 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 um, uh, so that's that's kind of like that cool block diagram of what a cognitive radio, like very 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 simple, what what it should look like. All right. So, we like for the most part, people got like adapt pretty pretty well understood right there there's mod cod right there's like uh, modulation adaptive modulation encoding uh, right uh, like uh, there's radios out there that like you know if you have if you have these environmental parameters you execute these actions we see this in a lot of communication standards um, uh, and and so on and so forth and then of course sensing well like again that's something that like a lot of radios do uh, or it's built in built in functionality but it's that learning that learning that learning that learning Right? So communication folks have done a pretty great job in terms of sense and adapt. But what about learning? Okay? So what about learning? What about learning? So first of all, let me see. Ha, ha, ha. So learning, okay, we're going to have to like look for some guidance here. So what we want to do is we really do want to optimize our communication system to the environment. Right? So what we do is we go to back to our like, you know, Hall of Fame. Right? what I at least perceive as Hall of Fame. And there's one more head. If you notice, there's this very annoying blank space here. And I, I, it's, it's intentional because I want to put in another person here. Okay. So uh, <laughs> how many people would have figured that? Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm going to put Darwin. But there's a number of folks who have looked at okay, like, uh, things like uh, the evolution right, 
of a lot of different species, a lot of different animals, uh, like, you know, both vertebrate, invertebrate, uh, insects, uh, amoebas, you name it, right? And what happens is we turn to nature, okay, in terms of this ability to do sort of that, that, that learning, right? And learning is actually um, a little bit complicated, right? Like, uh, it's like, because what learning does is it takes the environment, okay? And if I haven't experienced it, then I want to make sort of the best possible decision based on what I've already experienced, right? And so, so we really do turn to nature. And that's what our brains, when, especially when we're growing up and trying to develop uh, this sort of decision-making capability, uh, that's what we're trying to evolve, right? In terms of being able to, uh, you know, sort of grow uh, the ability to adapt, right? Automatically. And so we take experiences we haven't seen and then, okay, this is what we do. And trying to optimize those decisions, right? All right. So, um, what do we do? What do we do? So, um, I like to say, like, in nature, it's all about survival of the fittest. And it, it makes sense, right? Because if you have a sub, like, so let's say you have a, a species or two species, what is survival about the fittest? It's all about going after resources. It, it literally is. Like, it's kind of cool. Like, my wife, she insists on having hummingbird feeders, which uses a lot of sugary water, like a lot, like these. So we have like about 20, 25 hummingbirds downstairs, like in outside my kitchen window, and they're like fighting it out, right? And, and it literally is a fight for survival. Like what you'll see is you'll have one family of hummingbird and you have another family of hummingbird and they fight it out. They literally scare each other away. Zzz. And then on top of it, you have like, I don't know where they're coming from, a bunch of wasps, which are like yellow jacket wasps. They're very nasty little animals and such. And they too are fighting with the hummingbirds. So now you have this melee of different animals all going after this limited resource, which we're putting out for our entertainment, right? So what happens is, all of these animals have been optimized in order to maximize gain, give it limited resources and challenges, right? Like if you have other hummingbirds, right? Same species, but maybe not part of the same family or completely different species like wasps. So they optimize their behavior and their tactics in order to maximize their access to that resource, which is limited. Right. Of course, it's not really super limited because every day I have to pour more sugary water into those, to, to those feeders. <laughs> so what ends up happening is um, they're, they're, they're like the, sort of the basic of like, you know, that sort of like, you know, how do you maximize your reward and stuff really comes down to something called exploration um, and, and, and exploitation. Right. So what you want to do is you want to explore your environment. So these hummingbirds, as an example, are going around and, and they're trying to explore their environment. And there's tons of flowers around my house, right? So they're checking out flowers. Oh yeah, there's nectar here, there's nectar there. But then, oh, holy smokes, they found a hummingbird feeder. And it's like, like the mother load, if you will, of, of sugary water, of nectar. So if you look at it in terms of maximizing reward, that's maximizing reward, like big time. So what they're going to do is now's the time to exploit. So they're going to go to that hummingbird feeder and continuously get that resource until one of several things happen. Either another species or same species but a different family uh, begins to fight with them and then they have to make the decision, is it still worth it? Or the, the, the sugary water runs out, in which case it's like, well, we've exploited this re, uh, resource to the best of our ability. We have to resort to the next best possible answer and such. So, so, so that's really kind of like, you know, <laughs> looking around my house, um, this idea of the learning, right? I'm going to check my environment. Where will I maximize reward? Okay. And it's time varying. And then when I found possible options, I exploit. And I do that as best I can until that resource is no longer available or there's a better resource available somewhere else. Okay, so from a communication standpoint, forget about hummingbirds and wasps and all that for a second, even though it's very entertaining to watch. Um, from a communication standpoint, and I think there's already... Uh, so there's already a question, so excellent. So um, uh, you, should I, should I answer questions in real time or should I save it to the end? Alex, let's save to the end, and I will uh, watch the questions for okay. you for now. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. 
So, okay. so from a communication standpoint, uh, what are things that we want to do? Well, um, and I think this actually ties into the question that the gentleman just asked. Um, so what, what are things that we want to optimize? Bit error rate. Um, lots of bit error rate, not so good. A little bit of bit error, rate, bit error rate or no bit error rate, very good. Throughput, maximizing the throughput is actually pretty cool. Minimize power usage or transmit power, also good. Spectral efficiency, we also want to be spectrally efficient and so on and so forth. And in order to achieve that, there's a lot of knobs that we can, like parameters that we can change in our individual radio, okay, that can achieve those goals, right? But remember that uh, these communication systems, like for instance, like if we look at uh, this guy here, like this graph, minimize bit error rate, there's quite a few parameters that you can tweak, that you can modify in your cognitive radio, right? Or forget cognitive radio, just your radio that you can achieve that goal. Or if you want to maximize throughput, there's a number of parameters that you can change in order to achieve that goal. Uh, minimize power or uh, minimize spectral interference or um, spectral efficiency. It should be maximized spectral efficiency. So what happens is you can have multiple goals, you have multiple parameters, you, multiply, you multi modify the parameters in order to achieve these goals. Excellent. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes these goals somewhat contradict each other in terms of like what parameters. You might have to maximize one parameter. Oh, but wait, I need to minimize it to achieve that other goal. Now it's a balancing act. Now it gets more complicated. This is where the learning becomes. Where's that, where's that fine line? How do you tune that radio? This is where the learning comes in. This is the cognitive radio that we're talking about, right? All righty. So with this, okay, like for instance, like I've, I've used this equation for about, uh, about a decade and a half, right? What it does is, uh, what you have is like, let's say fi of x, okay? This is what we call a fitness function. Uh, x is probably a vector of a bunch of parameters that you can tune. And what fi of x produces is a fitness score between zero and one. Zero meaning absolutely horrible horrible configuration of X to give you the best possible results. So zero is the worst value. One is the best possible value. And WI is the importance weighting factor. How important is that fitness score to your overall goal, right? And F of X is your overall fitness function. So if you have, let's say here F, F is the weighted combination of individual fitness functions, okay? Uh, like let's say minimize bit error rate, uh, maximize spectral efficiency, yada, 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 right? And then weighting, how important is minimizing bit, bit error rate? How important is maximizing spectral efficiency and all that, right? Because different applications have very different objectives, different sort of which goals are more important than others. Now, there's a problem with this formulation. There's a huge problem with this formulation. There's a lot of correlation between these different parameters. So, now things, if you want to account for that uh, correlation, becomes a little bit more tricky, maybe even not mathematically tractable. All right. So what do you do? Okay. Da, 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 da. This is where neural networks come in. Uh, what is old is new again, right? So neural networks have been around for quite a few decades, right? Um, uh, and and it's be, been used in a lot of applications. So what, what held it back? What held it back until recently? Computing technology. So we go back of several slides and I talk about computing technology. Well, very important. Computing technology uh, very much is correlated to now using these advanced algorithms because now the computing technology is caught up to such a point that we can run things like neural networks in near real time to give us answers in, in a, in a, you know, with low enough latency that it becomes meaningful, becomes actually useful because before neural networks, the problem with them is part one, training, part two, executing. We have to have a lot of memory. That was expensive years ago, not so much now, in order to optimize our radios to the current environmental conditions. So neural networks, super important. And most people say, oh, what's, what's a neural network? Wow, it's like a black box, right? No one really knows what a neural network is and stuff. Well, neural network, okay? is essentially, so you have essentially what it is, it's this, this lattice, if you will. Like this is my explanation. You probably find it differently on like Wikipedia or textbooks. But my interpretation is essentially it's a lattice, okay, 
um, of uh, essentially of these nodes. So, so essentially you have like an input, okay? Uh, this input now goes into a bunch of these nodes called neurons. So what the input factors do is uh, they weight the inputs, they sum them together, they're modified by some sort of function, sometimes like some sort of sigmoid function or some other type of function, right? And then what happens is those functions are then fed to the next layer of summations. First of all, those, the, the outputs are weighted, summed together again by the next layer of neurons, okay? There are then another sort of functions applied to the output of the, those summations, and then pass forward to the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer, until they reach the output layer. They're summed together, weighted sum, applied another uh, some sort of function, right? Like a sigmoid function, or other, and then the output, right? And that gives you a fitness score. What this does basically, is if you have something that's mathematically intractable, you take this array of weighted inputs to these sums that are multiply, mul modified by these functions, and then you have multiple layers, and you train the heck out of it, such that you reach some sort of lattice with a set of weights, okay, given a set of these functions and summations and such, such that it will represent a fitness score that if you did have a mathematically tractable equation would be would correspond to if here's a bunch of inputs this is your score at the output would would be pretty much that so without being without deriving that mathematical function you would basically train the heck out of a neural network in order to give you that same sort of input output relationship now uh, big number one question how the heck do you train this thing and it's very tricky and then what's the structure of this thing and, and this is the issue. Like for instance, in this work we did with NASA, uh, what we did is uh, there's a variety of different flavors and setups that you could use. We actually used a levenberg marquardt back propagation training algorithm, okay? We had three fully connected layers without bias. Uh, we had two hidden layers with seven and 50 neurons each, and we used log sigmoidal transfer functions, right? So like that's our ingredients for this, but th there's a number of other ways that you can set this thing up. Right? And then you have to train, and you have to train, and you have to train. And the training is the really hard part, okay? Now, um, so before we go into neural networks, so save that in, I'm going to save that in my pocket, uh, the neural networks. So with the NASA project and the cognitive radio and the space communication link, so space is a very, very interesting and challenging environment, right? Especially because we have long transmission distances, right? Uh, just in low Earth orbit, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in that wireless communication channel. So what we need is a way where that communication link can adapt to the environment, maybe even predict the environment a little bit, in order to keep that link up. Because there's a lot of things that can bring it down. Also, depending on what wireless frequencies that you're using. All right? So awesome sauce. So what we use is this thing called reinforcement learning. And the way reinforcement learning looks like is something like this. Okay, so you have this thing called the agent. <laughs> do, 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 like agent, right? So, uh, so this agent, what it does, it, is pro it produces an action. So it says, okay, um, um, you know, thing, setup, environment. I'm gonna say, you're gonna have to do this. This is your action, right? You're gonna have to assume this configuration. I'll describe a little bit about how precisely this setup a reinforcement learning is used in what we did with respect to this NASA project, okay, with the space communication project. So it produces an action, okay? The action is applied to an environment, and then the environment produces something called a state, okay? So given that action, the state assumes a configuration, and it, with that configuration, there is a specific reward, right? It could be bit error rate, it could be signal strength, uh, it could be uh, packet error rate, uh, it could be any number of things, but there's a benefit. Right? It could be multi, multi, these multiple parameters, uh, multiple uh, goals all combined together into a single sort of value. And then that gets fed into the agent. And the agent based on state, based on reward says, hmm, is that a good action? Should I try another action? Uh, which way should I go in terms of uh, continuing to send out these actions to this environment uh, in order to maximize my reward? And you might say, huh, what? Well. This is what I mean. So suppose you, this, this is kind of like a, kind of a cute example of a discrete set of actions, right? So what happens is 
the way it works is I give an action, okay? And that puts, that puts my, my, my environment in a specific state, right? And in this case, what I wanna do is, okay, action puts the environment in a specific state. And then it's like, okay, in this case, do I have a reward or do I not have a reward, right? And so what I want to do is ultimately, I want to go above this threshold that says, okay, uh, you're above that threshold, there is a reward. Because below it, you don't have a reward. So what I want to do, this reinforcement learning is, it encourages okay, uh, my actions uh, based on my, uh, on my agent. It's going to basically be encouraging my agent to uh, produce actions that push my system, my environment, to states that produce actual rewards. I wanna to lean towards maximizing my goal, not minimizing it, right? So I, I, I was kind of cute. I, I was trying to refresh my memory on how exactly this worked. And I was like, you know, just playing around on the internet. And, and then somebody referred to it as like training a cat or a dog. And I'm like, yeah, that kind of works. It's like, you know, um, if, if oh, what do you do uh, with a cat or a dog if you want to make, uh, you know, um, uh, make it do a specific action, like, you know, sit or walk or heal or anything like that? Well, you use, like, if the, like my dog, for instance, is incredibly food motivated, right? So if I wanted to uh, reach some sort of goal, right, um, I, and, and, and pursue that through an action, I, I give it a reward. Um, so like, let's say, hey, captain, walk and it doesn't walk. Well, that is not the state I want. I, like if I give an action, I want it to go into the state of walking, right? So captain doesn't walk. Well, no reward for you. Um, hey, captain walk and uh, he doesn't walk. Well, no reward. Captain walk and he kind of gets the clue and he starts walking. Ah, good boy, give him a biscuit. And what happens is as he begins realizing every time I do, if I say walk and he walks, he goes into that state, I give him reward, I give him reward. He gets closer to that maximum goal. So here, okay, in the space communication world, we like in the setup, I want to achieve that. Now, how do I do that? Well, uh, in order to do that, so what's the mathematics a little bit behind this? Well, it's a little bit, it's a little bit messy. But what happens is there's something called the, like, you know, in Q learning, right? There is something called this action value function, right? So state, action, and then it produces a value, right? And here, what I, what, like, you know, if I, like, you know, if, if let's say I, I, I knew all possible states, all possible actions, I would use some sort of greedy approach and just brute force it and try and maximize sort of the action value, QSA, by going across all states and all actions in order to, to achieve that, right? Mm, okay, uh, sure. But uh, instead, what happens is uh, if I use, and I'm gonna show this in about in a couple of seconds, if I have neural networks and I have uh, reinforcement learning for like deep Q uh, networks, right? Uh, what would happen is, um, I, what I would do is I would have something along these lines here, right? So th this one, actually, I actually, I do need to. Um, so here, what happens is, what I've got is R is the reward. I have some sort of thing here, gamma. Gamma is a discount factor, right? And this maximum here, this is the maximum S, uh, like uh, 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 what I have here is, this guy here is a discount factor of, and I'm trying to maximize here, the optimum value of a future, uh, like uh, this is my estimated future value of that action value, okay? So what happens is, it's like, okay, I have the present reward and this is my estimate of the future. And then what I do is, this is my estimate. So I'm like saying, okay, uh, if, I, if I do this future state and this future action, I should get this action value. And it's like, and then of course I dampen it with this, uh, this um, discount factor gamma. And what it does is it leads on. It says, I, I would, it's leading on saying, if I head in this direction, ultimately I'm gonna be maximizing my, uh, my reward. I'm gonna to get to my maximum goal, right? And then what I do is I subtract off this guy here, which is um, the old value. So, so what happens is it's sort of like this difference uh, between um, like uh, what my reward will, will is, okay, minus, uh, plus what it will be multiplied by this discount factor minus the old value of the action value. 
So this in some ways, what it does is it leads in, and this is here guy, like, you know, the neural networks and the reinforcement learning for deep Q network kind of helps me lead, lead my process, my reinforcement learning towards ultimately attaining the maximum goal. Okay. So in the case of the space communication system, what we implemented here, okay, is what we have is an agent. It executes an action. This, there's actually one little boo-boo here. Uh, this action should not only be at the transmitter, it should also be at the receiver, right? Because we have, we have to match parameters at both ends, like either transmit rate, transmit power, all that jazz, right? And also don't forget is that we have the communication channel and it has a bunch of stuff that's going on there too. Latency, uh, any sort of scatter and any other sort of impairments that would affect the quality of the signal as it goes from transmitter to receiver, right? So what happens is we have this agent, it produces an action, it is applied to transmitter, it's applied to receiver. Environment, there's, it, it makes no sense. Like it's not going to apply to the environment. So transmitter receiver gets this action. And then what ends up happening is we then observe what state this entire transmit channel receiver configuration enters and what is its reward. It goes to the agent, and then what it tries to do is it tries to say, oh, okay, what's my reward given the state? Uh, where should I go with the next action in order to maximize my goal? Whatever it is, right? Could it be maximize, uh, um, a minimize bit error rate, spectral efficiency, uh, maximize bandwidth, any one of those factors, right? So what we wanna do, okay, is to go along the lines of trying to set up the agent such that as it looks at that entire communication link, right, it sends actions to it in order to, to ultimately lead it to a set of actions that optimizes the performance, right, maximizes that reward. Now, um, the problem with uh, satellite communication channels is sadly, uh, they, they, they are, um, there's a lot of uh, time variation with respect to them. So here, this is a cool example. Like, you know, we could do some prediction. We actually looked at some predictive techniques in order to follow, like for instance, the signal strength um, as a function of time. Like, so here's a time series. And so the purple is the actual received and the yellow dashed line actually represents what we're predicting in terms of that signal strength. When things are not super erratic, when they're like, okay, like slowly varying, things are good. Like, you know, we can kind of track more or less what, the, uh, what that signal strength is and we can tailor it. We can tailor our transmitter and receiver parameters. Our agent can do that in order to optimize that communication link parameters, that reward. But when things get bad, right, like this sort of erratic stuff here, like after uh, uh, time uh, 225 seconds onwards, well, then it's really difficult to predict. In fact, uh, we could do some tricks, right, um, but, but then, it, uh, again, it gets complicated. So uh, we can, first of all, we can predict far out, but then we can over and under predict or uh, what en ends up happening if we predict too soon, what happens is our prediction's kind of short-sighted and we're wasting a lot of computational cycles trying to do that short-term prediction. So finding that happy medium in terms of predicting not too far out, but not too close is by itself a kind of cool research problem. Okay. So, so remember I talked about with the hummingbirds with respect to explore versus exploit? Well, that's another factor, all right? So with, with respect to that agent. So not only is that agent trying to see what the state is to, to, to uh, judge, uh, you know, to produce a reward, to then issue actions. Well, there's also this monitoring. Remember sensing the exploring part? Well, uh, the problem is how frequently also do you monitor, do you explore a scenario before you issue, uh, issue actions, right? So here, this is a great plot. Okay, this was actually published in ICSSC, right? Uh, which is part a conference of the uh, AIAA, right? Uh, it's uh, not IEEE, not IEEE, no, it's okay. But it's, it's a great organization. Like uh, they focus mostly on aerospace applications. But here, what we have is a case where we have 50% of the time exploration, 50% of the time exploitation, right? So 50% of the time we sense, we learn, we look what's going on, and 50% of the time we're like, act, 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 right? Issue actions, get rewards, get states, go, go, go. And uh, you can see that uh, we are constantly issuing actions. It's very erratic. We're wasting cycles. But is it really necessary? Do we really need to, to constantly change actions all the time? 
in order to, to, to try and fit the performance of that channel at, uh, at every given second? And the answer is not really. If you do some prediction and only, only exploit when needed, you get something like this, right? So you only act when you need to, okay? When the channel, the, the channel, the environment, the radios have changed significantly that it requires a new action to get to your new goal. And the rest of the time you're just like, mm -hmm, I'm just monitoring this. Uh-huh, okay, cool. Okay, I'm keeping my eyes out, right? <laughs> and then otherwise you exploit when needed, right? All right, so. Neural networks, now I'm pulling this guy out of the pocket. We kind of saw it with the deep Q learning, right? Uh, we have like the reinforcement learning agent, and then you have the environment, and then all of a sudden there was neural networks somewhere. Okay, so given my brief 30 second tutorial on neural networks, so all of you should be experts now in neural networks, uh, why do we have the neural network? Well, and tying this into computing technology, so now you have these radios with crazy computing horsepower, that are performing really cool algorithms and can run neural networks, assuming that they're trained, okay, sufficiently, what ends up happening is we have the agent, it issues actions, it gets states, it gets rewards, but what happens is, instead of this kind of guesswork of saying, uh, I'm gonna do this action, uh, I'm gonna do this action, and try and get to the maximum reward, what we can instead do is before we even issue an action, Suppose we have a neural network that has been trained to look like the environment that I'm issuing actions to. So suppose I create a neural network that mathematically captures what the environment looks like in terms of fitness score, in terms of relating action to reward and state. Oh, this is excellent. So what happens is before I even issue the next action, I do kind of a pretend internal action on my radio itself saying, what happens if I try this action? Well, you get this state and reward. Okay, how about this action? Well, you get this state and reward. And I sort of do it internally really fast because now computing technology comes to save the day. We can do this really fast. We can now say, okay, after doing all this stuff with my friend the neural network inside, I'm willing to now test this out on the real world. Here's an action. Whoa, I actually got a lot closer to my maximum goal than I would have if I just did all this guesswork in real time. So if I do it internally before I do it externally, this is a powerful tool. Now, problemos, lots of problems. So the problem is not all environments are the same. What happens in environments suddenly changes? Let's say there's solar flare activity. Let's say there's interference from somebody else. Statistically, what I trained my neural network before with is no longer valid. The equation is no longer correlates strongly with the environment that I'm testing my action to rewards and, and all that jazz. So what I do is I create an ensemble, okay? A collection of neural networks, each one capturing a different environment. Now the challenge is uh, which neural network best captures the environment to do that reinforcement learning neural network thingy with, okay? So that's very, very, very super duper important. That was actually published in the IEEE Cognitive Communications for Aerospace Applications Workshop in 2017 in Cleveland, okay? Um, and so this is really important. So we're gonna have, if we go back, imagine this neural network is full of an ensemble of neural networks instead. So now we have to have a neural network selecting the right neural network for this agent to test things out for this specific environment in order to come up with the appropriate actions. Okay, cool beans. Now, let's take this one step further. Suppose you have multiple actions that you want to execute at the same time with multiple rewards. Well, then you're going to have the multi-objective performance reward. You're going to have multiple ensembles of neural networks that you're going to have to use in order to come up with the multiple actions that are all happening at the same time for your radio. So it's no longer increase data rate, decrease data rate. Now it's increase data rate, reduce power, um, minimize bandwidth, use this uh, pulse shape for this uh, raised cosine filter, da, 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 da. So now you're gonna have this crazy huge multitude of neural networks all being driven by uh, this reinforcement learning framework, okay? Now, 
uh, you get things like this, right? So this was actually published also at that same workshop where we try and get the actual over the air performance, right? With that fitness score and then the, the projected versus true. And, and, and again, there's still some scatter, right? But what I'm more worried about, okay? This was sort of follow on work. So the first part of this work I described up to this point was uh, my PhD student, now graduate, yay, Paolo Ferreira, Dr. Ferreira. And now I'm gonna go into the master's student work of Max Lee, who graduated with his master's, awesome sauce. And uh, he looked at, well, I talked about training. I talked about, okay, the neural network is gonna be only as good as how, much, how well it's trained. Ah, so what happens if you have a non-stationary environment and you're constantly training, 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 and what you're training with, no long, what statistically looked like a few moments ago, several epochs ago, no longer statistically correlates anymore. Well, what you're doing is you're beginning to forget the past experience with that training of that neural network, such that when you reach the end, it's like, oh, shucks, I forgot the statistics of several moments ago, several epochs ago, because that got overwritten by the new epochs of training data, right? That's actually not so good. So, so what do you do there? Well, very important, very super duper important, you're gonna have to look at ensemble learning, right? So what we did is uh, we came up with an approach where we, when epochs look funny, Right? When they statistic statistically change, we start adding new neural networks okay, that are trained in the ensemble to capture that specific uh, statistic. So what happens is, imagine a deck of, deck of cards. Oh, none of these neural networks statistically correlate to what the new environment looks like. Okay, add a new card, add a new card, add a new card, such that now you have this growing number of neural networks to choose from that match to the environment so you don't have to retrain such that you don't have to forget when you're training you overwrite previous uh, neural networks in their training okay so it makes it more efficient because otherwise the reason why it's catastrophic for forgetting is because you're now forgetting what you trained before and it's like oh shucks now i have to retrain that and if you retrain that now you're forgetting some other training and it becomes uh, woefully inefficient Okay, so that's what this algorithm talks about. First epoch, and then um, like, you know, so is it the first one? So you train and then you create your neural neural network and then you're done. And then uh, what happens if it's not, you go through this process of creating new neural networks, okay? Uh, based on new statistical data that you're training with. Okay, so this, okay, so now I talked a lot of stuff, okay? About uh, what the heck happened here in terms of um, reinforcement neural networks, okay, ensemble learning. Um, I talked about uh, neural networks in itself, uh, talked about like how the reinforcement learning works in the space communication channel. Let's talk about what we did with the scan test bed, okay, that was on the International Space Station. We ran experiments in May of 2017 and August of 2018. So two separate tests uh, in order to actually do this in real time, okay. So the sc scan test bed, here's it in space. Okay, we had a BPSK receiver. We had a, a, in parallel, what happens is on the downlink, we had a DVBS2 transmitter, this, and, and that had that waveform, okay? And what we did is uh, we had a ground station, okay, at Glenn Research Center, and that's in Cleveland, Ohio. And what happens is we had on the downlink, we had an RF uh, hardware. Uh, it, it, we used both a Viasat DVBS2 receiver as well as a NewTek DVBS2 receiver. And ah, here's the magic. That's the cognitive engine. This is all the neural network ensemble learning stuff that we did. And what we did is we ran experiments with just a conventional Levenberg Marquardt, the recursive Levenberg Marquardt, and the uh, and, uh, an ensemble learning approach based on the algorithm that I showed in the previous slide. So that magic box was credited critical because we looked at how well those three scenarios worked okay uh, in actual space communications throughout a variety of different uh, um, functions and data rates and expectations and then on the uplink what happens is we use an ml 605 SDR uh, and a bunch of other RF hardware to send it back up on the uh, on the uplink okay and so what happens is this 
This is what um, the scan test bed looks like. So you can, if you put scan test bed into Google, you're going to find these pictures. This is how it's mounted or was mounted on the ISS. Unfortunately, this got replaced by another experiment uh, on the same sort of contact point on the ISS. So unfortunately, there's no more scan test bed, but there are going to be other opportunities to do SDR in space. I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Okay. And so what ends up happening is we got results for like just regular Levenberg Marquardt. Uh, we got uh, results for uh, recursive Levenberg Marquardt, and then we got results, obviously, for um, uh, you know the ensemble learning approach here, okay, using NSC framework. And so again, we just like looked at and compared with the different data uh, produced by these different um, uh, different approaches to see uh, how well or how poorly these uh, different approaches with the neural networks work with respect to catastrophic forgetting. Okay, so. Um, uh, future applications. Ah, so I have my copy. I'm not sure about you folks of like the, the August edition. Oh, I, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this of IEEE Spectrum, uh, the August uh, 2020 edition. So if you go to page, da, 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 where is it? So if you go to page, it's, it's, it's uh, page 44, okay, uh, is the start of the description of this entire project, okay, and then where are we going with this? Where's cognitive radio going in terms of space communication? Okay. Well, um, oh yeah, that's such a cool diagram. I, re I really, really, really think that's a cool diagram. So what happens is in this, uh, in this issue, so I have uh, my collaborator from Penn State, Sven Bilen, as well as collaborators at NASA Glenn Research Center, uh, Dale Mortensen and Rich Reinhardt, and myself, yours truly. So what we did is uh, we kind of described uh, sort of the capabilities and what we've learned about cognitive radio so far and where they are going. And where are we going? Well, everyone's talking about deep space, deep space, deep space. And you might say, what the heck is deep space? How about the moon? Everybody's shooting to the moon. And why is that? Well, the moon is going to be kind of like the sort of obvious next step, not because we want to set foot on it and take soil samples necessarily, but it's going to be kind of that springboard theoretically to sort of even deeper space missions like Mars, right? Because the amount of energy um, and fuel and logistics to get, let's say, payload off of the surface of the Earth, especially with gravity, is uh, woefully expensive. But on the other hand, if you set up an operation around the moon, and then use that to build, let's say, missions to Mars, uh, theoretically should be a lot more cost effective. So let's look at uh, such a use case, like where cognitive radio can be used. So this actually comes straight, straight from, the, uh, from that uh, um, August issue of IEEE Spectrum. So things like, for instance, like I'm not sure how many of you watched the movie The Martian, uh, but imagine if cognitive radio was there, uh, such that that the um, uh, the the Martian uh, you know the the astronaut that was actually on the moon uh, no, sorry on Mars stranded didn't have to worry about communications and and all the sort of nasty things that happened but rather uh, the radio itself would adapt send a signal to a relay signal in orbit around Mars send it to this thing and, and there is a mission right now NASA is pursuing this something called Lunar Gateway so imagine ISS but around the moon. So that's going to be really important. That's going to be the starting point for future missions to Mars. So it's going to send that signal to Lunar Gateway that then can send it to, let's say, a communication signal uh, to, uh, to, to a, um, a satellite around Earth and then to, let's say, wherever uh, mission control is on Earth. Okay? And so there's a lot of steps where communication issues could occur. Right? So and you're not going to have a human necessarily at this satellite or that satellite or that satellite. And you might have a lot of like sort of impairments along the way that could really affect that communication link, especially given how complex it is and lack of human intervention. You need something automated. You need something that can learn on the fly and build and, and be able to adapt to the environment. And so that is one, one of many use cases where cognitive radio can be used. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop there, okay? So fan, uh, finish. Uh, that's my email address. So uh, in case you, you're unable to ask questions now, but you have some good questions later, uh, feel free to drop me a line. And um, again, thank you all for, for your attention and uh, um, glad to present some of the stuff that I talked about. Thank you, Alex. This my, is my, a my really... Pleasure interesting and exciting uh, uh, talk uh, you just uh, given. Um, 
we have uh, uh, two questions in the Q and A uh, box. Uh, one of those uh, probably you touch on a little bit early on, uh, which is what's the best sensor node tap that could be employed in the cognitive radio sensor network, and also with method is better to use distinguish between the node fault or attack effect regarding of the cognitive radio sensor network. Oh, that's a good one. That's actually a really good question. So, uh, so for so the first part of that question, so what's the best sensor node type that could be employed in a in a cognitive radio sensor network? Um, so, it, okay, so so I'm I'm going to try and figure out like so so let's say if you have a sensor node, and uh, you're well well the thing is um, it all hmm. So I think I think um, I'm, I'm, because I'm trying to sort of figure out what what exactly type means, but um, but let's say if you have a bunch of um, sensor nodes uh, distributed around an environment, right? Um, and uh, architecturally, what you want is let's say your sensor node is trying to observe something, um, so it needs to classify what it's observing, what it's sensing. Um, so to me, an inefficient architecture would be one where sensor node, tons of sensor nodes, take data, use a ton of overhead, communicate it to a central location. Central location has to parse through tons of data in order to create kind of like a holistic picture of the environment around it. Okay, um, not the best use of bandwidth. It's gonna use a lot of power on the part of the sensor node. And then you're gonna to have to have a server or servers parse through all that data, depending on what the sampling rate is of that sensor node. My, my take would be the, the cognitive radio should be adaptive in terms of what, the what is the environment that it's uh, trying to sense. Like, let's say the, like, uh, like uh, first of all, it's gotta to have to monitor its power supply because the last thing you want is a sensor node that decides to die, right? Like a, a, a sensor node with a finite power supply is um, and with and the battery the, the battery power is gone and it, it's it's no longer active is a useless sensor node you don't have a sensor node so so suppose let's say your sensor node has a finite power supply maybe it has a solar panel but maybe it doesn't so the uh, the cognitive sensor node needs to monitor that the other thing is when should it go on so it's gonna like so when does it decide to sense so so it's going to have to adaptively figure out, it's going to monitor the environment, it's got to sample the environment, when should it turn on, when should it absorb information, and then when should it communicate information. The next thing in addition to that is even if it senses the information and it becomes uh, data prohibitive, like a lot of data, it might have to choose how much of that data needs to be parsed out. So, you know, like, let's say, can it compress it? Can it pull out only key features and therefore save bandwidth, which means save power, which means also save overhead channel. Uh, then on top of it, um, perhaps uh, if it's, let's say, distributed too, maybe there are other sensor nodes nearby and it could maybe talk with each other to reach some sort of consensus on what it is observing, right? So, you, so maybe there's also some sort of like um, ad hoc networking that's going along. Right, and also when the node is dead, right? If the node is dead, maybe the other sensor nodes can communicate that, or, which kind of alludes to the second question, um, what happens if, let's say, it's under attack? It's being fed fraudulent information. Uh, if, um, if it's being jammed or anything like that. Well, now those cognitive sensor nodes all have to kick in. So um, what's gonna hap have to happen is if it's jammed, you might want to do dynamic spectrum access, uh, try and out, outpace the jammer and go to a band that it doesn't know where it is. It might want to transmit at a lower power. It might want to use a different waveform. It might want to use CS, uh, CDMA, which makes it hard to jam. So, so really this, this question could go in a, a gajillion directions. But, but I think the number one thing whenever I look at sensor nodes period is power. It's power and it's a overhead channel. Um, you assume that the central location that ultimately takes the data and processes it is going to have a more fixed power supply, but you still are worried about like how that information is going to be processed, right? Um, and you don't want to feed it too much, so it has to parse it out. So if you could do it at the sensor node and, and filter it out, that's better. 
but but that's in my in my take to me power and the communication channel is really important and then fraudulent information the other thing is let's say if you're doing something where you're trying to sense somebody and that somebody doesn't want to be sent so they send out fraudulent information to a sensor node there's also again that consensus building maybe other sensor nodes are with a higher reliability detecting something different and you might want to ignore that sensor node so i think i know that's a long question but it's a it, it, it could go in a million different ways, but, but a very good question. Thanks, Alex. Yep. Uh, the second question uh, uh, is that for over-the-air training of the DQN, how does the agent at the satellite get feedback about the reward, ah. such as the BER? That's a good question. So there has to obviously be feedback, right? So it's not just like satellite to ground station, it, it, there has to be kind of the loop close back. I think in the case of like with the experiment that we did, we, we assumed one link up and then the other link we just did like conventional off the shelf DVBS2 compliant hardware, right? Because um, like, you know, and that's also kind of like the song and dance, right? So what happens is um, all of this, it kind of, you, you kind of want to close the loop, the machine learning if let's say you have two nodes and they're talking with each other, there, there is the feed forward, right? Like, you know, the, sort of the uplink uh, or the downlink, depending which way you have the link. And you want, to, you want to optimize that link, but then you have like sort of the overhead saying, yeah, you're doing great, or no, you're not doing great. Otherwise, it doesn't know. So, so what could happen is, let's say the receiver is just sensing sort of the channel and maybe some, does some basic sensing and it says, I think this is good enough for you and just blasts away a signal. And then it, the onus is on the receiver to figure it out, but it's, it's not optimal, right? Um, it would be optimal if let's say it gets the BER information, let's say packet error rate, maybe even let's take it a few layers up. So in our work, we dealt mostly with phi and Mac layer type of parameters. But the nice thing, because here's the thing, DVBS2, the standard specifies also mod code, right? Adaptive mod code, modulation encoding. So it, do, it too does like, you know, the, the adaptation of the physical layer and Mac layer. But our framework theoretically could also go all the way to the application layer. So, so and DVBS2 doesn't, right? So, so, the, so the thing is, we, we, let's say we can look at something at the transport layer and we can really take it to town in terms of ad, adapting that to optimize performance. But all of that has to have closed loop feedback. So great question. Very good, thanks, Alex. So I have uh, um, another question uh, uh, coming in, uh, which is uh, uh, for the training of the neural network, is it done online or is some part done offline from previous measurements? And then second part of the question is, do you have example of the duration needed to predict certain type of channel? So, so uh, yeah, so, so the thing is we would, we would do the training initially offline, right? Um, but what would happen is in terms of um, like, you know, as that algorithm with the creation of more ensembles happen, uh, that is, so that's where the, the real time online would have to kick in as well, right? So you start off with a basic set of neural networks and then you begin adding more into the stack in terms of like the additional neural networks that have been trained. That like, so th because that, that's the only, like that's part of that learning process, right? It's like, if you haven't experienced it before, uh, you're gonna have to start somewhere and it's not like, okay, hey, communication system, hold it. I need some time to train. No, you, you, you try and do that while you're moving along, right? And, and then what happens is later on that neural network that, that goes over the ensemble would then select it. And then as you go along, it would continue to train uh, based on where it left off base, assuming that the statistics make, make complete sense. So. Yeah, absolutely. So the final question on the uh, chat box is that, uh, uh, can you introduce a bit more about space communications and navigation product testbed? which is a scan testbed in the article uh, in the ITV spectrum. And uh, then what uh, new ideas or solutions of scan testbed aims to demonstrate and verify? 
Well, okay, so great question. So SCAN, unfortunately, uh, no longer no longer is operational. So it, it so 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 just like with every other experiment, if you will, on the International Space Station, um, it, it it has a limited shelf life. So it's like, okay, we have an experiment with measuring electromagnetic fields coming from the sun against the Van Allen belt, blah, blah, blah. They put an experiment on and you, you indicate to the, you know, the, the folks who run the International Space Station saying, this experiment's for five years. And at the end of five years, what they do is they detach the, the experiment and it jettisons into space, right? So scan test bed is, is a really big box. It, it's shelf life, unfortunately, in 2019, they detached it and it reached the end of its operational mission. Yeah. Uh, but there are a lot of other projects out there that are looking at, that, that are planned for the future that will also put SDR in space. Whether they're community resource, I don't know. Like, but I know that there's talk. Like, I think the thing is, it was successful scan in, in, in a lot of ways because it provided a resource for the community and for people to prototype new waveforms, new algorithms like what we did and test it out in real world conditions in space. Yeah. But, but there are a lot of other projects that are coming out there that are, uh, that are using SDR. So if you look at like uh, folks like, like other, if you type in like NASA and SDR, um, there uh, on Google, you're going to see like that there are projects on the horizon that are coming out and other uh, space agencies as well, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, in summary, we have tested some um, real-time 5G link from the uh, satellite. We're using the uh, intercept. Yeah, yeah. And so, the problem. Yeah. Yeah, so that, 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 I mean, because I think that's, there's actually funny enough so if you check out, like I, I, I have, um, I have um, um, a workshop, not IEEE, <gasps> not IEEE, not <laughs> but, but, yeah. but, but it's, it's a good one. Yeah, no, it's called yeah. the New England Workshop on Software Defined Radio or New yeah. SDR. If you go into YouTube and you type New SDR, so N-E-W-S-D-R 2020, um, you'll see, like I recorded this thing because we had to go virtual this year. It was from a month ago. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, it, the entire video is like seven hours and 30 minutes, but there's a lot of, uh, space. Like, so it's the real talk time is about five hours, six hours. Uh, there's a company, there's a company, a startup company in the Washington DC area called link L Y N K. So, or you go to their website, link.world and they build satellite solutions for 5g direct to your phone. So you don't have to get a special phone. You don't have to get the phone with the ginormous antenna. You literally, 5G phone, I'm the subscriber, talk of satellite, and it talks to every other, and it connects to the 5G network. And, and okay. this is interesting because of the accessibility. Um, oh, that part of the country doesn't have any 5G access points. Okay, no problem. You know, so it's, a, it's actually a very, very powerful, uh, and a lot of people are talking about it. It's the talk about using cellular networking in space like so you obviously have um you know uh, global star and iridium and all that but you need to specialize hardware for that now 5g and satellite communications are the worlds are colliding yeah uh, agreed alex uh, we are aware we are some kind uh, um part of <laughs> <laughs> that journey in some part yeah yep that's a fun journey thank you for sharing this very interesting yeah. thank you you no this was a great experiment uh, experience and uh thanks to everyone who's on on the call as well these are great questions absolutely um uh, i have another question sorry i have another two questions uh, coming in one is how community radio can be used in 5g um so oh in 5g so um, so moo. So, um, so 5G, I would say cognitive radio is going to be, um, I think it's going to be important in things like, of course, I, the IoT part of 5G. I think it's also going to be very important in terms of um, um, dynamic spectrum access, uh, uh, in terms of like uh, being able to select which bands because it's going to it's going to build upon existing 4g spectra right it's going there's going to be actually it's going to be really important in places like the five gigahertz band in the united states 
also the six gigahertz band. So 1200 megahertz of spectrum just got opened up. It's unlicensed. So 5G has got to compete with other unlicensed applications in order to make connections there. I would say cognitive radio in a super duper big way is going to really grow in 6G. Right now, 5G is like doing a lot in terms of harmonizing different types of communication architectures under one umbrella and also enabling everything from the smallest and lowest data rate devices all the way to like gigabytes uh, per second of uh, data at millimeter wave frequencies. I think 6G, you're going to see even higher frequencies, but you're also going to see a lot of intelligence across that. So, so that's like that. That's going to be huge. Cognitive radio and five five G right now is like start. We're starting to explore the you know sort of use case models, especially in things like self organizing networks. So SON, it was talked about in LTE Advance. It's now uh, definitely something in terms of things like you know mobility management, um, and six G is going to be even bigger, especially if we do things like unlicensed access and such. Thank you, Alex. Uh, final question. In terms of successfully communicated data uh, versus data transmitted but not received, what level of improvement can be expected when using cognitive radio? Uh, for example, 50% of packet loss is experienced without cognitive radio. Would the application of cognitive radio might be successful uh, data transmission can be expected to double? So a, a, a little bit detailed <laughs> question. Well, the only thing is I, I could give a smart aleck response and say it depends. No, <laughs> no um, so, so uh, with, co with cognitive radio, it really will depend as you saw with the neural network, right? It's also gonna depend on the hardware that you have. Uh, depends on how flexible your platform is going to be. So, so, and there's a lot of ingredients that I left out, right? Like, you know, for instance, the RF front end itself, like how flexible uh, and the environment and what you call, like, you know, so, so packet loss. Okay, great. Uh, but how big are the packets? Uh, what is the application it's trying to achieve? So it really will depend. Um, what I will say is, it's, it, it will create more breathing room. And again, I can't give a quantitative number uh, because that, that would be good PhD research. So if any of my PhD students are on the call, quantitative, right? Uh, but, but I think it will really depend on the application. It will depend on the platform you have. It will depend on how you train those neural networks and the architecture that you're assuming for the learning in the cognitive radio system. Um, it's going to depend on the environment. So it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of factors. So I can't, I can't really give a number of like 50%, 10%. Um, the thing is, is that like, for instance, from our space communication experiment between uh, what we did with cognitive radio and DVB-S2, like if you look at the experiment, like DVB-S2 is pretty darn good, right? If you tweak data rate and you tweak power, power level and coding rate uh, between what we did and uh, DVB-S2, it's like maybe a slight improvement, but we basically brought like this humongous algorithm to play and DVB-S2 is like, oh yeah, lookup table, bloop, 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 and gives an answer, right? So it's kind of overkill. But like what you mentioned, like packet error rate. Ah, very interesting. Can, can we modify the packets? Can we change frequencies? Like for instance, um, like uh, for instance, like one great dynamic spectrum access story what happens if I have a cognitive radio that can switch between KA band, uh, which is really nice. KA band is like lots of spectrum, 24 to 30 gigahertz approximately. But the problem with it is uh, the wireless channel is very tricky. Um, and then let's say there's like space weather and makes it bad. Oh, I need to go to S band, but S band doesn't have as much free space. Everybody's transmitting in S band, it's kind of crowded. So, but my cognitive radio knows how to go over there, throttle back the data rate, maintain the link, maybe li link maintenance versus just the link completely going dead for a little bit in KA band. That, that, that's very difficult to assess quantitatively um, unless you like, like, you know, actually build the algorithm, but that's kind of a use case that well, one good use case that we were kind of mindful of uh, with, with all this. So like the dynamic spectrum access, as well as tailoring like many more layers, just not the physical and Mac layer. Of, of the communication system. Very good, Alex. Uh, I think this is a 
uh, excellent uh, answer. And those are part of uh, the journey. I think uh, if I interpret your answer correctly, that uh, this is a call for our community to research on more and to looking at it 50 or more and less or other numbers, depending on what research and method tools uh, we're going to develop to achieve such goals. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think this is, there's like, you know, like you don't hear much about cognitive radio or cognitive radio is becoming a commodity item. I totally disagree. I think machine learning and how it's advancing um, and all the solutions out there and all the capabilities that are available, we like, you know, there's so, there's so much that we can do, you know, and, and machine learning, it's like, I, I feel like it's, it's, there's a lot of opportunities and space is just one of the many different places that we can apply this, uh, this technology. I, I think there's a lot of great opportunities. I think the computing hardware is there, the, the algorithms, the computing, computing, computer science is there. It's now putting that to the use cases that we thought impossible 10 years ago and making it a reality. Yeah. So follow on question uh, by the same, uh, um, um, same participant asking before, do you think the cognitive radio is a, a, a technique uh, is incremental or potentially um, suppressative? Uh, uh, um, wait, wait, wait. Uh, one step or a few more step up? Oh, I mean, I, I definitely don't think it's incremental. I, because, because I think what happened is like, I would say there was a phase in cognitive radio where we're like looking at genetic algorithms. We were looking at case-based reasoners. We were look at like, you know, the, the uh, like, you know, some types of, uh, um, some types of machine learning constructs. And then we kind of reached a plateau a little bit. And I think, you know, every, every everything has its moment, you know, like for instance, like these cell phones and small, very powerful microprocessor systems that now my teenage, new uh, undergraduate students come into the classroom and say, oh yeah, this could do a gajillion things, right? Like I would say there's a few moments that led to it, but one of them, like, you know, think Steve Jobs from Apple and he ho held this up and every, and then the race was on to make smaller, more powerful, faster, right? I would say machine learning and this renaissance, if you will, like, you know, everyone going gangbusters over the, the like, you know, going neural network, deep Q learning, all this jazz is because of like Google, Google summer of code, and just like how data science is like driving machine learning innovation. And we, again, our community, the cognitive radio community stands to benefit a lot because we now have the hardware. We understand the, we understand, we have the computing hardware. We have the RF hardware that's evolving. Uh, we understand it well. We've developed the use cases, and now it's like, wow, we've got these new powerful tools, and this can create some really revolutionary opportunities. And also, smaller form factor, IoT, and and now how 5G as a standard, as an example, has like really permeated with this idea of smart world and uh, cyber physical systems can really like you know we can make a real difference here. Great, thank you very much, Alex. So awesome. Thank excellent you. talk, fruitful uh, uh, answers to the questions from audience. And again, by giving the time, we already occupied 24 more minutes yep. than we originally planned. So again, thank you very much for thank you. the talk. Uh, if I may, um, uh, we'll stop here. And okay. if any participants have any questions, please do email Alex. Uh, and yep. he's a such energetic and enthusiastic um, researcher in the field in the community radio in space and machine learning. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Shirley. Bye. Thank you, Alex. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.